said, we've never heard you preach a sermon and a half. <laughs> Ain't you got snacks to get ready or something? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, or Ephesians chapter 5, one or the other. I don't know which one I want to. Huh? Oh, my preacher's wife. Hebrews chapter number 11. This, yeah, I bet he's probably in there shouting glory. Yeah. She laughed, so you say amen. Hebrews chapter number 11. We better get started, hadn't we? All right, still talking about uh, the faith of Abraham. And uh, we're going to read from verse uh, 8 down through here, and we're going to, our text tonight will be verse 17. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called. Now, I want to go ahead and make a time out right here. And uh, uh, the Bible breaks up Abraham really in three sections right here, but, but sort of in two, depending on how you, how you want to break it down, I guess. But, but the number one is his following faith. It says right here, verse number 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. So the faith uh, to follow God, all right? And uh, now we've talked about in this study for however many months we've been doing it, about faith and these heroes of the faith. Heroes of the faith, that's the terminology that we have put on it. But it says here that um, this faith, verse number two, for by it the elders obtained a good report, okay? Uh, and so heroes of the faith is what we call what 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 makes a hero what takes what it takes to be a hero of the faith and to, and Abraham is a very good example and uh, for the things he done and we should model our life of faith after Abraham his following faith God said to go and he obeyed and he went he didn't know where he was going God said follow me leave your leave your father and your mother leave all your family leave all that stuff and follow me I'm going to show you a place and so Abraham obeyed all right and, uh, you know, I've often used this illustration that most everybody wants faith. Yeah. I mean, if you're saved, you want more faith. You, if, if you're saved and you know God, you want to be a better Christian. You want to live closer to God. Or you're just so, if not, you're so wrapped up in the world, you're, you're in a mess. But you ought, there ought to be something inside of every saved person that wants to have more faith, wants to live closer to God and do those kind of things. And, and uh, Abraham is a great example of that faith. And I often use this illustration that everybody wants the faith of Abraham when he's got the knife held and he's got Isaac, his only son, stretched out there. Everybody wants the faith of David when he's fighting Goliath. <coughs> but th neither one of them started out with that kind of faith. Abraham started out, God said, now the first recorded faith of Abraham, now it may have been going on before that, there was obviously a relationship between the Lord and Abraham. And God told Abraham, he said, I'm going to show you a place, you need to leave where you are, I'm going to show you a place. So he just started following God, <coughs> where God wanted him to go. And, and King David, he didn't start out uh, killing giants. He started out obeying his father. Just like Abraham did, he was watching the sheep. That's what he was doing. And then the next thing you know, a bear comes out, and God gives him the strength, he kills the bear. And then the next thing you know, a lion comes out, and he kills the lion. And he even confessed to King Saul. He said, look, I killed a lion, and I killed a bear, and they prepared me for this Philistine right here. And, and, uh, but that's the faith starts with a little. It's a, it's a seed of faith. The Bible calls it a measure of faith. God has given every man a measure of faith, and it's up to us to cultivate that faith. God is not, according to the Scripture, now God may do this. I'm not trying to handcuff God. God can do what God wants to do, right, as long as it's right and not wrong. But if we see in the Bible, God does not just walk up to a person and pour out great faith upon them. God gives them a little faith. God gives us the faith. God puts that in us. Every man, the Bible said, God gives every man a measure of faith, a little bit. God gives every, every child has faith. The Bible talks about unless you be converted as a little child, childlike faith we call it. 
It's up to us to cultivate that faith, to exercise that faith, to cause that faith to grow. There's something that you and I have to do. We have to believe God. We have to put God to the test. We have to exercise our faith, and, and that's what Abraham done. And so uh, let's read on here. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city who, which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah, Abraham's wife, uh, received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and multitude and as the sands which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That's what you and I. Uh, that is, in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared, prepared for them a city. Now, verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, that is a uh, son of faith, okay? Now, we know Ishmael was the son of the flesh, right? And Isaac was the son of faith, okay? And so Ishmael was the firstborn. Remember the doctrine of the secondborn, okay? Uh, the, the first birth is not any good. It's fleshly. This, this first, first birth, I was born November 24th, 1970. The son of Charles and Linda Randolph, no good. But the second birth... The birth of faith, when Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, okay, and uh, born spiritually, born by faith, and that's what Isaac was a type of, our Christian life, born by faith, born again, okay. Now, this second faith was follow-through faith. The first faith we talk about was uh, the following faith, where he followed God. The second faith was a follow-through faith. It was a faith that could be tried. It was a faith that could be tested. And nothing can be more, nothing is more remarkable than the offering of Isaac upon the altar. Now, you and I, we've talked we talk about great faith with people that we've seen and people that we know, but you'll never find anyone in or out of the Scripture with greater faith than a man having through faith received the child. Abraham was too old to have a baby. Him and Sarah both too old to have a baby. The Bible calls, talk, talk about uh, Sarah as one as good as dead in the womb. Too old. Abraham, too old by human standards. Too old naturally. And so having received this promise of this child and then having received not just the promise but having received the child and then being willing to take this child. Now they say by all accounts Isaac was about 20 years old when this happened. But took this child that he had received by faith and taken this child and putting it upon an altar and raising a knife and being willing to sacrifice that child. There is not a greater faith in or out of the Scripture. You'll not find it by humans. You'll not find it. What great faith. Rightly so, the majority, uh, there's more said about Abraham in this faith chapter than anybody else. Abraham, not only Abraham, but his family. Talk about Sarah, his wife. Talk about his children and in his children's children and on down. I said it before I say it again. When God got Abraham, God found a faithful family. Amen. You know, when God got Charles Randolph, God found a faithful family. I don't know at what point in my mom and daddy's life that they decided to raise their family in church, but thank the God of heaven that they did. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful for it. What did God get when he got your family? I hope he found a faithful family, somebody he can do something with. That's what he found in Abraham. There's a good message in that, man. They've been a good devotion in that. What God found in Abraham, or what God found in David, or what God found in Ruth, or what God found in Isaac, or what God... Hey, man, that's pretty, that, well, that sounds like a good series or something, don't it? All right, Tip, write all these sermon ideas down. But nothing is more remarkable than that. I look at that, having children, I look at that, and I think, I couldn't do that to your child. I couldn't do that to a, to a child that I don't, I don't have the faith, I don't believe that, to do that to somebody. But Abraham did. He, that's, that's remarkable faith is what he had. 
The greater the faith, the greater the commitment to doing as God says to do. Now, people can do a lot of acts, and people can do a lot of things, but there's not a greater faith. Now, listen to me. There's not a greater faith. There's not a greater uh, 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 showing of faith. You know, James said, show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by my works. The greatest way to show your faith in God is obey His Word. There's, that's what Abraham done. Every one of these people is what they done. Enoch walked with God. You know what he was doing? He was leaning on God's Word. Cain and Abel. Remember Cain killed Abel? What they do? They listen to God's Word. That's great faith. What did Noah do? The Bible talks about Noah's great faith. What did Noah do? He was warned of God. And he obeyed, and he built an ark. I mean, we could, we could say, well, I'm going to take my faith, and I'm going to... I'm going to but not if God didn't say do that. Remember, we talked about a biblical premise for your faith. We can't just go outside of that premise. Now, it's great to do things for God. I mean, go down here and borrow a million dollars from the bank and give it all to missions. That's great. Go ahead and do that. I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll see you. We'll write you letters when you get locked up for bank fraud, you know? But... But that, that ain't God doing that. There's no greater showing of faith, no greater exercising of faith than obedience to God's Word. Now, people can pop their gums and they can talk and they can do all this kind of stuff and, and, and attempt great things and do all this kind of stuff, but if it's not obedience to God's Word, it's not faith. It's a show. And there's a lot of that in the world, religious shows, right? That's you and I, we base that off. I've seen, I seen today uh, there was this church, and uh, that's what was on the sign anyway, and they was painting the rainbow colors on the steps. And uh, this journalist come up, and he said, what are y'all doing? And this woman, she said, well, we're, this woman passed her, and she said, we're painting the rainbow colors on the steps. And they're like, well, why are you doing that? And, and they said, well, we want everybody to know that this is all-inclusive, that we are like God, we're all about love. And this journalist said, uh, well, I have a question for you. And she said, yes. And he said, does God approve of homosexuality, of same-sex marriage and all this? And this woman preacher, she said, well, of course he does. The Bible says God is love. Oblivious to truth. Oblivious to it. And, of course, the, the journalist said, well, could you give me a Bible verse condoning and she's like, well, no. Well, I don't know any Bible verses. I just know the one, that God is love. <laughs> that's like all the drunks know one Bible verse. Jesus turned water into wine. That's, that's all they know. And all the, all the people that are sinning and don't want nobody preaching again, they know one Bible verse. Judge not that you be not judged. Hey, me and Brother Kevin talked about that a while ago. That's all people know. And, but anyway, uh, I don't know how I got way out on that, but, but the greater the faith, the greater the commitment to doing as God says to do. Abraham, if we measure up, puts to shame most commitments today. Most people are not committed to what they can see. Like the church. I'm just going to say, if a person cannot be committed to what they can see, they'll never be committed to what they can't see. Amen. You can't boast of faith and not obey the Word of God. You can't, let me say that again, you can't boast and brag about your faith and be disobedient to the Word of God. That is how we exercise our faith. That is how we show our faith. Like I said, that is how we prove our faith, by being obedient to God's Word. That's what Abraham done when he was tried, it says, when he was tried, verse 17. Now, I'm fixing to go into some linguistical, ling, 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 language things. Linguistic, ling, linguini, that's a word. All right. ling, ling, linguistification. Now, that is a word. I just made it up. Linguistification. Okay, all right. Uh, it was brought to me a couple of weeks ago, um, and, and I know y'all covered it some in James and, and in adult Sunday school class, about being tempted and being tried and things like this. Now, it says in uh, Genesis, okay, turn over there to Genesis chapter, what is that, 22, I believe, where uh, God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. 
Okay, I want some, we're going to make some little clarification here on some words about being tested and being tempted and being tried, okay? Uh, you have to understand, especially Greek. A Greek that the, the New Testament was, was uh, originally written in Koine Greek. Koine just means the language of the common people, okay? It was the global language at the time. What's the global language now? English. Okay. Now, in Abraham's day, you know what the global language was? Hebrew. Okay. Now, it began to change a little bit in Mesopotamia during the Babylonian captivity. Therefore, part of Daniel is written in Aramaic. Okay. But everywhere else in the world, globally accepted, it was Hebrew. Then, when in the time of Christ, the globally understood language, everybody understood some portion of Koine Greek. All right, not classical Greek. That's a, well, New Testament was written in classical Greek. It was not. That's a lie. Okay, and but anyway, it was written in Koine Greek. Now, Koine Greek is the most specific language ever devised by humanity. You were never understood when you spoke in Koine Greek. Never. Okay, for instance, we have three tenses, right? Past, present, and future. Okay, in our language, that's what we have. Okay, let's take test, okay? Say, you're going to take a test. That's future, okay? You have been tested. That's past, okay? Now we say, I'm be, I am, you are testing. That's present, okay? Greek has 13. The Koine Greek has 13 tenses. Okay, never understood. Well, everybody knows about the word love. You got phileo, okay, brotherly love. You got agape love. You got all these different kinds of love. You and I have one word, we have love. I love to deer hunt, but I love my wife. I love the Lord. Three different kinds of love, but one word. In the Koine Greek, all different words, all different words. Okay, so um, when translating in from Koine Greek, the most specific language humanity has ever come up with into English the most general language. I mean, we can say stuff like, man, that's hot. Now, there's a whole lot of different things that might mean. Right? Or, man, that's cool. We just, we just, in an English language, we just make words mean whatever we want them to. That's fly. Dope. Dope was bad when I was a kid. And my mom was a kid, dope just meant medication. I go take my memory, my granny said, I need to take my night dope. Right? You go up, we, we learned this, you go up into Washington State and you tell your wife, hey, I need some Coke money. <laughs> Everybody in church look at you funny. Okay? And so, so language, it's a, it's a problem translating anytime, anytime you translate from one language to another. Okay, you have barriers. You always do. In your King James Bible, you'll see italicized words. Okay, those italicized words were words that were not in the original manuscript, but these translators, these 54 translators, they put that word in italics to let you, the reader, know this word was not in there. We had to add it for literary clarification. So you would know the translators added that word. Okay, now... The King James Bible is the only one that does that. Your NIV won't do that. N you know, New American Standard, won't, the other 250 modern English translations, they don't work, italicize their words because who knows what they've added, what they took out, what they've, you know, it'd be a big jumbled up mess, okay? But, but anyway, that's what those italicize. So here's what we have in Genesis chapter 22. Okay, Genesis chapter number 22. It says right here, and it came to pass, verse 1, after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am, okay? And he said, Now take thine son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, get thee to Mount Moriah, and offer him up for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now, notice what that says. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a what? burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I shall tell you of. Do you know that he was supposed to offer him as a burnt offering? So do you know that he had his knife out and was going to kill him first? Mercy. He's the father. Isaac is a picture of the son. 
That's mercy is what that is. If you don't kill somebody before you burn them, you're horrible. So mercy. Anyway, okay, so, so we have here the word tempt, that God tempted Abraham. Go to James chapter number 1. I was asked this uh, a few weeks ago, and I'm glad we're getting to, to cover it now for some clarification purposes. James chapter number 1 says this, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Well, what about Genesis chapter number 22, verse 1 and 2, that God tempted Abraham? Okay, now the word you and I have for tempted could mean a lot of different things. It could mean tempted, which tempted in our language means to entice to do evil. The devil tempted me. He enticed me. She tempted me. He tempted me. They, I was tempted. I was enticed to do evil. Okay? Now, the same word, can te- tempted, can also mean to test. To test. Like to prove. Okay? Or it could mean tried. Abraham, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, it says, when he was tried. Okay, now, this word, and you know, I'm an English guy, I'm an American, I speak and I write and I read somewhat English, okay? Now, but sometimes we need a little clarification. So, this word in Genesis chapter number uh, 22 and verse number 1, where, where God tempted Abraham, was the word, and it, it's spelled N-A-C-A-H, and it means to test or to prove. It's a Hebrew word that means to test or to prove. That word, when, when God tempted Abraham, the, he did not use the word to entice to do evil. He used the Hebrew word to test or to prove. Okay? So, Abraham was test. his faith was tested a lot, just like yours and I, I your, ours is. Okay. All right. Now, now, uh, but Abraham, it says he was tried. That tried could be translated tempted or tested. Either way, that word tried could be translated uh, to, to, uh, to entice to do evil or to prove or to, you know, <coughs> to test it or try it. Okay, so here's what we have. In James chapter number 1, <coughs> well, now here in Hebrews chapter number 11, um, his testing, his temp, he's tried, that is... To test, right? We understand that. All right, James chapter number 1, verse 13 and 14. The word tempted, that when a man is tempted, <coughs> don't say he's tempted of God. That tempted right there, that word is this. It's spelled P-E-R in the Greek, P-E-I-R-A-Z-O. <coughs> means to entice, okay? James 1, 13. Let no man say when I'm tempted of God, that I'm enticed. God does not entice a person to do evil, okay? But then, where it says that God cannot be tempted by evil, that's a whole different word. And the best I can find, that word is used one time in your King James Bible. And that word, God cannot be tempted with evil, that word literally means untemptable. God's not even temptable. See, whenever you're talking about being enticed to do evil, the word that we use for us to be enticed to do evil can't even apply to God. So it has to be a completely different word to say neither can God be tempted with evil because you can't even use God's... Obviously, God can't even be enticed. And so the Bible had to use a whole different word. God had to use a whole different word that means not only does he not, can he not be enticed, that God is untemptable. It's impossible for God to be enticed or tempted to sin or to do evil. I just thought that was amazing. Okay, so, so all right. And so God does not entice a person to do evil. But God will tempt or test, God does not tempt to entice to do evil, but God will tempt as in test a man or woman. God will test our faith. A faith that can't be tested is no faith at all. Yeah. Now, why do you get tested? Think about school or driver's license or work. Some, some factories will test you once in a while. If you want to advance, you take tests. And do so. why, the, why, why, why test a person? Understand, I want you, now we're talking about 
Test, and we're talking about faith. When you're in you're a teach, school teacher, I mean, we've got several school teachers in here. They're not all in here, but we've got two sitting over here. We've got one here. We've got one over here. We've got school teachers, okay? So when school teacher, now, I know what the student thinks, but the students are they're, they're dumb sometimes. Sometimes, the older they get, the dumber they are, okay? But, but, but the purpose of testing is not to destroy the student. Now, the student may think, so they're trying to ruin my life, just all these tests. No. It's so the teacher... The principal and the school board and the state education department can know where you are on a subject. That's the purpose of testing. Testing is not to destroy the student. Right? I mean, it's not. So when God tests us, it's never with the intent to destroy us. It's to find out where we are on a subject. God tempted, God tested Abraham oftentimes. Okay? Now I want you to notice Faith will be tested. Mark it down. You might as well concede to it. Your faith will be... God will test your faith. If you're saved, God will test your faith. God will allow you to be tempted. God's not going to build a hedge of protection around you to keep the devil back that you will never be tempted. God will not build a hedge around you that you will never be enticed to do evil. It's just not how it works. That would be nice. But that's just not how it works. Because faith is to be tested. So you will know, and so God will know, where you are on the subject. Okay? Uh, Abraham was tested often and greatly. When God had him leave his home, he was tested, and he passed. During the famine, he was tested, and he passed. With his family, he was tested, and he passed. His integrity was tested after the, after the great slaughter at Kedoliomer, or however you say that, and he come back and the king of Sodom wanted to pay Abraham, and Abraham said, no, no, I don't need money from Sodom for doing the right thing. I like that. Basically, he said, I don't need, because there ain't no way I want anybody to say that you made me rich. So he passed the integrity. But Abraham didn't pass every test. He didn't pass the lie test. He failed his lie detector test. When he went down to Egypt and he told him down there, he said, no, she's not my wife, she's my sister. That's a lie because he was scared. He failed the test. And he took Hagar. God done told him, said, y'all going to have a baby. Testing his faith. They couldn't wait. His wife come in, Sarah, she said, hey, God said we're going to have a baby. Use Hagar. Failed the test again. Now let me ask you. He's failed two pretty good tests that we know of. Did that destroy him? No. It didn't kill him. God didn't wash his hands of him. And as far as I'm concerned, those are pretty big tests to fail. Oh, I mean, you lying about your sister or about your wife that she's your sister. Now, I mean, in some cases, you know, cousin, you know. But he just flat out lied. And then, his lack of faith, he failed the Hagar test. You ever failed a test? You ever failed one of God's tests? Absolutely. But that don't mean it's too gonna, it should destroy us. It don't mean it should knock us out of church. It shouldn't knock. Look at Abraham. What he do? He just kept doing the right thing. He said, God, I'm sorry. I failed that test. I'm sorry. God, could you still use me? Could you still do something with me? He still brought up his children to serve the Lord. He still stayed where he was supposed to stay. He was still a good husband. He was still a good boss. He was still a good daddy. He was still a good grandpa. He was still a good servant of God. Just because he failed a few tests of faith, he didn't quit the ministry. He didn't quit church. He didn't quit on God. But boy, today... One failure. Well, I've just I've messed that up. Yeah, but it ain't it. I remember one time when Drake was little. I mean, he's still little, but he was littler than he is. He was six or seven years old. Got his first F on a test. And they was at our house that weekend. Me and him was laying there in the bed watching TV before we went to sleep one night. And I mentioned it to him. Of course, he started crying. It upset him that I knew. And I said, look. It ain't the end of the world. You don't fail the test if you get an F. You fail the test if you quit. 
That's when you fail. You've got to try again. I'm not going to ask how many people failed their first driving test or failed their first written exam on a test or failed their first CDL test or something like that. But guess what? They didn't quit. Even the fourth or fifth time, they kept going back and taking that driving test. Like, man, he didn't pass them all. A test is designed to see where you are on a subject. It's not to destroy you. A test will direct you. It'll tell you where you're lacking on it. A test should drive you, drive you to do better. Some people fail a test and they quit. Some people fail a test. It's a shot show of character. They fail a test, they're going to do better. That devil, you got me that time, devil, but you ain't getting me there next time. Now, you may get me, but you ain't getting me there. Nuh-uh, you ain't doing that no more. I ain't failing that test ever again. And it will, listen to this, it ain't all moonlight. It will discourage you when you fail a test. It will discourage you. I mean, just imagine you're, 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 you're trying to make good grades in school. You're trying to, you want to be, you know, you got maybe valedictorian, maybe you got salute, or maybe you got, you want to go to college and you want to get all this stuff and, and your parents expect you to make good grades. You're smart, you're intelligent, you're doing, you're doing all the right things and then all of a sudden, boom, you miserably fail a test. You fail. But you don't quit. You don't quit school. I mean, how, how preposterous would it to be for your child to come home and say, I've been, I know I've got 10 years invested in school. Just a couple more years, I'll be done, but I failed a test, and I quit. I quit. You'd say, look, you don't quit over one fail. There's a lot, you'd say, look, there's lots of tests. This probably ain't going to be the last test you ever fail, especially if you go to college. Especially, I mean, there's tests, there's tests, there's tests. This is just one test in a whole bunch. <coughs> Well, think about your life with God. Failing a test. It might be a big, it might be the SAT. It might be the big test, and you failed it. But how silly would it be for you to come to the pastor and say, Preacher, I failed, so I guess I'll quit. And the preacher will say, Now, wait a minute. There's lots of tests. You've been taking the faith, test on faith for the last 13, 12, 13 years of Highway Baptist Church. God's been testing you. You've been passing all these tests. You've done good. And now you got up here and you failed one. Yeah, but everybody knows. Well, the only reason, they look at what all they failed. But you don't quit. You just, keep, you just do what Abraham did. I think, I think, you want my opinion as your pastor, you know what I think? I think a big reason that Abraham is in this faith chapter right here, not because he failed, but because he didn't quit. He kept going. He didn't let one failure knock him out of serving the Lord. He kept on, and he kept on, and he kept on. Amen. You know, uh, I should have done some research on this. I'm going to use this example, but I didn't. Babe Ruth. Does anybody know how many home runs he hit? Bunch but not near as many times as he struck out. Not near as many. He didn't get near as many home runs as he did strikeouts. But he kept stepping up to the plate. Kept stepping up to the plate. Dale Earnhardt, anybody know how many NASCAR races he won? Not near as many as he lost. Mark Martin, the greatest... NASCAR driver to never win a Winston Cup championship. 20 years he drove in NASCAR. Never won the championship. But it didn't stop him from keeping on driving. So why is it that Christian people are so different? Just in this one, not that people, the people are different, but just in this one aspect of our lives. Why are we so, we fail God one time, we think it's the end of a ministry, we think it's the end of a world. I'll tell you something about Brother Kenny Townsley. They used to be down at Sapple Missionary Baptist Church. He is a family of some of the people that go to that church. They live down in Arkadelphia, and he was pastor of church for a year, 20, 30 years he was pastor of church. Until one time, he fell into sin. And he run off with a woman named Judy from their church. 
and had an affair with her and left his wife. And we know the wife. We know the kids. We know their grandkids. Huh? Yeah, Tidwell. Yeah, what did I say? Townsley, didn't I? No, that's my cousin's husband. Anyway, anyway. It, won't, it don't matter to you. The name don't matter to y'all. But anyway, him and Sister Judy, they, for seven, eight years, they wouldn't even go to church. He wouldn't pastor. Nothing. But they moved back home to Saffa, down there where Tiffany and I grew up. They got things right with God. Brother Kenny began to be our adult Sunday school teacher. And I don't know how many lives he helped. I don't know how many he helped. But he could have let that, and it's public knowledge, everybody knew. His widow still goes to church down there. And I remember when he got that cancer, and then he beat the cancer, and it come back, stomach cancer. We was there one day, me and Brother Kurt Hired was there one day, and we said, well, Brother, he said, what are you going to do now that you've got cancer again? And this is where I got this statement I said all the time. He said, God can't bless nothing. He said, I'm taking the treatments. Right. I've got to give God something to bless, but he can't bless nothing. Amen. And what a great, what a great, what a great man he turned out to be. But he could have just quit and never went back because he... He, he felt disqualified to pastor, but he could still do something. He could still do something. Thank God for him. Hey, man, failure is a great teacher. <laughs> failure is a great teacher. Boxers, you don't learn when you're boxing. You don't learn more when you hit that guy. You learn more when he hits you. I just went. Failure is a great. Te- well, that didn't work. I remember one time we had a tree limb hanging down. I'm gonna tell this on myself. I was a lot younger than back then. She's already giggling over there. We, I don't know, we was young, girls was little. And we had a four-wheeler, and ice storm came. And one of our tree limbs in our tree in our yard was on the ground, but it was still connected to the tree. Great old big tree. And I thought, you know what I'll do? We were poor. We'd have nothing. We'd just starting out. I didn't have a chainsaw. I didn't have all that kind of stuff. But we had a four-wheeler. I mean, priorities, right? And so I took that four-wheeler, and I thought, I'm going to run this four-wheeler up on that tree limb, and it's going to break off. It don't work that way. I run that four-wheeler up on it, and that thing went down, and shoom, over that four-wheeler on top of me, we went, and they were just out there giggling, and they just thought it was the funniest thing. But you know what? I learned something that day. Don't do stupid stuff for your wife. <laughs> that worked out a lot better in my mind than it did. But failure is a great teacher. You don't learn near as much from your successes as you do your failures. Matter of fact, Jessica can probably spell school. Was it you or Keisha? In the spelling bee, Keisha, wasn't it? In the spelling bee when she was little that misspelled school. And I mean, never forgot how to spell it. I mean, it's pretty embarrassing when you're at school spelling bee and you misspell school. And I don't know if it's her or Keisha, I don't remember which one of it was, but never, I mean, you could ask them any time after high school school, and they'd, boy, I mean, they'd spell it right out. You learn more by your failure than you do your successes. All right, let me go ahead and make it through this uh, next one here. Just, well, no, I'm not going to make it. We just got a couple of minutes. So we'll have an invitation. Sister Holly can play something. But, but uh, failure is a great teacher. Now, we don't, we 